Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. You probably weren't expecting a video so soon, but I thought to myself, it's been a busy 24 hours or so, um, and it's absolutely pouring outside, so why not, you know? There's plenty to kind of get our teeth into. This probably won't be as long as normal videos, to be honest, um, but there's just a few things I think it's probably worth having a little chat about. Um, let's start with the, the really good news, which is obviously Christian Romero. Um... Signed up finally last night after everything went through. Um, Tottenham waited just literally moments before I was heading into the cinema, uh, taking my daughter in to see Black Widow, um, which meant that I ended up getting kind of half of some information and then getting the rest of the information after I came out of the cinema, which isn't always the best way to do things. But hey, you can have the full information now. That's the main thing. Um, so essentially, what it is... Uh, what it was. It was a very strange one. If you saw the way it came out yesterday, so Tottenham announced it as a very straight deal. Um, and the information that came out of the club was that it was a £42.5 million deal and that um, it was a six-year contract. However, Atalanta put out a slightly different statement, which said that it was a loan with an option to buy. Um the truth lies more towards Atalanta's side, but slightly in the middle. Um, and I'll explain exactly what I mean by that in that. So what it is, it's actually a very clever deal. And it's, I'm told, exactly the kind of thing Fabio Paratici does and does a lot um, or had done a lot at Juventus. Um, you see it a lot of it in Italian football, these loan to buy with essentially it's an option. It's not an obligation, but it's an option that is expected by all parties to be taken up. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because what it is, especially in this case with Romero, Spurs have already agreed the contract with him um, to be able to, um, well, it'll be another five years on top of this year already. So it is, in essence, like the word coming out of Tottenham, a six-year contract. Um, and Spurs will pay £42.5 million for him. It's, I suppose the best one to kind of compare it to is Giovanni Lo Celso. It was one of those where everyone expected the deal to take place. It was legally termed as an, op um, an option rather than an obligation, but it was one that where everyone was pretty much expected to do the deal. Obviously, you know, I'm sure there's other sides to it. There may be other clauses involved. Um, it may be like with Lo Celso, there was this option to do it for a slightly cheaper deal if they did it in January compared to the summer. I'm sure we'll get more details about that sort of stuff as it goes on. But as it stands, it's very clever. Um, it's essentially, Atalanta and Spurs have worked out similar deals. So Atalanta bought Demiral from Juventus. Um, sorry, bought him again, got him on a loan with a view to buy him next summer. Um so yeah, it's 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 quite cleverly done really in that both clubs get the defender they wanted but in essence don't really have to end up paying any real bulk of the money until next year when all of their revenue streams start to come back up because fans are back in and everything. It's you know, I I'm I'm told this is very much the way Paratici likes to work but you know, Daniel Levy is going to love it, isn't he? You know, we know he's a Who's a guy who likes to um, save every little penny for Tottenham Hotspur that you po possibly can out of it in any transfer deal. And this one plays right into that scenario. Um, yeah, it's, you know, it's an interesting one because I think all of us um, expected it to be a flat fee. Um, and at the last moments, it seems, I don't know whether, the, I say last moments, this may well have been the plan. It may be what complicated it slightly further. I was always told it was a complicated deal. So perhaps that's what this has been. But yeah, to come out the other end with buying a player who was Serie A Defender of the Year, 23 years old, Copper America winner, played in the Copper Italia final, finished third in Serie A, uh, played in the Champions League, and is generally considered to have developed into one of the best defenders in Europe. To get him, in essence on a loan and then be able to buy him for 42.5 million which is a really good price for him anyway it's an incredible deal absolutely incredible deal um and what i would say i've been told this uh that 
even Lionel Messi is a, is a huge fan of Romero. And even in the final days of the transfer, was trying to get Barcelona to make some kind of mood for him. Um, but obviously, we know the situation with Barcelona. We now know the situation with Messi. It just couldn't be done because financially, they're so hamstrung. And uh, their loss is Spurs' gain. You know, it's, it's fantastic. And I do think there's a little bit of Agent Galini and Agent La at work. You know, Romero has since come out and said that you know, both of those players very much were bigging up Tottenham and telling him how incredible it was. He'll come in and wear the number four shirt. Um, the good thing as well is that he doesn't have to isolate. Um, he will come into the club and be able to kind of get going straight away. And the reason he can do that is because he's had, I understand, a, one of those single dose all-in-one jabs. Um, I don't know which kind. I know, I think in, in America, don't they have, is it the Johnson Johnson one? I think there's one called a, a, a Janssen one, or Janssen, which they use in Europe. I don't know, I don't know exactly which kind of vaccine he's had. There's, there's no real need for me to know that. But I'm told he's had this one single use vaccine, a uh, single dose vaccine, which means he doesn't have to, you know, vaccinate, uh, doesn't have to vaccinate, doesn't have to isolate having come in from Italy. Which is great, because it just means he can crack straight on. I mean, you've probably seen already images of him sitting in the canteen with Lo Celso, having a bit of Marte. Um, and he can just settle straight into the team, get training. I'd imagine it's probably too early for him to be involved against Arsenal tomorrow, but who knows? I mean, he has been in training with Atalanta, I think, for a week. Obviously, that will have been interrupted with everything that's happened in recent days. Um who knows, could well be paraded for the fans tomorrow. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but obviously I'll be there and it'll be, be great to see him there. But, you know, as I've said before, and I do not change my view on this, I think he could be a real game changer for the Tottenham defence. Very, very excited about seeing him come in. Um, he, everyone that covers Italian football and everything has told me just how much he's developed. Um, and obviously Paratici, Brought him in for general in the first place to Juventus and, and had high hopes. The problem at Juventus, it, it's, a, it's a tough defence to crack into with the players there. He had to go away and, and actually ended up being the best Serie A defender having gone away from Juventus. It's funny the way these things work. Um, so I'm really looking forward to him. And the fact that he already has that uh, relationship with Gallini, should Gallini play, um, you know, and also has Lo Celso link up as well. It's, yeah, I don't don't know how good his English is. Certainly, all the interviews we've seen thus far have, have been in, you know, in Spanish. Um, but obviously, there's enough players that either speak a Spanish, uh, speak a Spanish. <laughs> I was going to go to Italian. Then speak a Spanish. Either speak Spanish or obviously Italian that he would have learned from being. Uh, I think he's been in Italy for three years now. Um, so you know, there's enough players and then that, that will be able to communicate. And, and I think he said that Lo Celso has been acting as his translator anyway. And uh, that will all. That's all part of the process, and you know, and hopefully he will be there for six years. Um, six year deal, eh? I think we've heard that before, haven't we? In the recent days, um, yeah. But honestly, really, really excited about him. It, you know, it's no secret. Tottenham have needed that defence, having a big old upgrade to it for a while, and um, the fact that they've uh, managed to get one of the best defenders in Europe. You know, it's testament to Paratici. You know, Romero name checked Paratici and said how much he wanted him, and obviously knew him from Juventus. And I think this is a big deal. Um, you know, almost with that, I think I said this in the last video, with the Harry Kane stuff, it's maybe slightly overshadowed, which what for me could end up being one of the transfers of the summer. You know, this guy, fingers crossed, you know, you can't say for certain, you never can, because when a player is adapting to a very different league and, and the culture in England... And we've seen it so many times, but I'd say he has a lot of things going in his favour. You know, I think being Argentinian, I don't think the physical nature of the league will be quite as as big a step. You know, um, the Argentinian league is it's quite similar in that aspect. You know, we've seen the likes of Lamella and Lacelso have not come in and struggled with the physical side. You know, they've obviously had their injury issues, but physically, it's been no shock to their system. Um, and I'd hope for Romero that'll be the same. Um, and obviously next we'll be intrigued to see who he plays with. Um, because, you know, I understand that they've... Did I say he got the number four shirt? I think he did. I think I did. Just in case I didn't, I'm going to say that again. Um, but yeah, I understand that obviously we've had Galini, Hill and now Romero come in. So that's three in, which for Tottenham, before the start of the season, 
you know, isn't actually too shabby. Um, we can criticise Tottenham's transfer dealings quite a lot. But what I would say is getting those three in, I think they did the same last summer. So maybe they're actually starting to learn a lesson there. Obviously, Romero hasn't got much of the preseason, but he's still got a week or so to, to be able to work. Um, but that's, you know, God, remember the days when the bulk of transfers, Pochettino used to get so frustrated because pretty much all of them would come right at the end of the window when the season had already started. Oh, I remember him getting so annoyed sometimes, um, but not really being able to kind of sound off about it. Uh, but yeah, so my point was, they've done those three already. I understand the priority next two positions are another centre-back and a right-back. Uh, and then after that, they're going to start looking further up the pitch um, at other positions. But yeah, so that's great. So that means another centre-back. My understanding, and I've said this for a while now, was that they always wanted to bring in um, a kind of another leader type. Um, I wouldn't say Romero is a leader type yet. I've seen some people, I said that in the week, and I saw some people go, oh my God, £40 million pound for someone that isn't even a leader. And it's like, it doesn't work like that, does it? Does it? Some of the best defenders in the world might not also be leaders they just might be great defenders sometimes they just need that voice alongside them and I think Spurs have probably lost that in the back line since Jan Vertonghen went you know I think you know you could say let's for instance as a good example Toby Alderweireld superb defender one of the best in Europe but was he a leader probably not um, whereas I always felt Vertonghen was the leader in that kind of defense uh, so that's kind of what I'm trying to get at um, but yeah so It'd be interesting to see because obviously Alderweireld has now moved on. We know that. So if you're, you know, if you're going to look at maybe Eric Dyer being the experienced member of that central defence, you know, I know a lot of fans would probably not be too happy with that. But I would also say you're kind of missing out. So I do wonder whether this next centre back, um, obviously Tottenham's profile is more to sign younger players. That's the way they fit. That's why you know you look at. Uh, certainly Hill and Romero, you know, 20-year-old or 23-year-old. Gallini's 26, which obviously is young for a, um, a goalkeeper. But, yeah, um, I'd, I'd be intrigued to see whether they look to try and bring an older person. Now, again, this is not from any information or anything. This is purely opinion-based. And, and whether they just look to not spend a lot of money, but just bring in someone that's just got that little bit of experience. And, and this is a weird comparison, but those who might remember him... You, do you remember when they brought in Nuruddin Nabit, um, who for the most of the world and the and football would probably think, like, oh, what? <laughs> so are you really going to say that he, you know, one of the greatest signings in the world? He wasn't the greatest signing in the world, but what he brought in was a real experience to the back line. I think it was Michael Dawson he played alongside, who's just become a club ambassador, which is probably the most nailed on club ambassador appointment ever. Absolutely lovely guy and loves the club. But back to the point, Nabit, um you know, he was just that kind of guiding voice. Just that even if he wasn't the best defender in the world, he was just able to talk to other players and say, look, this is what you do. Calm. Do this now. Do that. Blah, blah, blah. And I just wonder whether Tottenham need that kind of player again. Like I say, they've probably missed since the Tongan went. Um, so, yeah, I'll be intrigued to see who the next centre-back is. You know, I do wonder, you know, whether they stick to the original. Because Paratici obviously had his... As I've always said, he has uh, 10 players for every position. So I do wonder, does that 10 players, that you know, we know the likes of Kunde were on there, Milenkovic was on there, um, Lacroix was on there, players like that. Does he stick with names from that list for the second centre-back? Or does he have another 10 that are maybe slightly more experienced leader types? That, yeah, I'd be, I'd be intrigued to see how that works. Obviously, with right-back... Um, I'd say the likelihood is that they go back in and continue talks for uh, Takahiro Tomiyasu, who is now done with the, the Olympics. He's an interesting one because he had an ankle injury that kept him out for the bulk of the start of the Olympics. Then he came back for the quarterfinal. I think it was against New Zealand. Then he missed the semi-final a couple of days later, which I think was against Spain, which they lost. But then he was back because I think he played 120 minutes against New Zealand. Then he was back for the final, uh, sorry, the third place match, uh, which they lost to Mexico, which he played 90 minutes against. So you'd presume his ankle is okay. Maybe they just didn't want to risk it in the semi-final, so like a few days after playing two hours. But uh, yeah, you know, as I said before, the last time I spoke to people on his side of it, they were confident that a deal would be done after the Olympics. It'd be interesting to see now whether Spurs, they'll go to tie that up. I mean, you know, 
if they managed to not pay the fee for Romero, which is still incredible when I think about that in my head, if they've managed to not pay a fee, that could free up the funds now for um, Tomiyasu, who were led to believe wasn't a huge amount of money, and they were looking for less than twenty million for him, um, or you know somewhere in that ballpark. So. Yeah, maybe that deal does get done now. It'd be interesting to see kind of where Spurs go with that or whether they then change their mind and go for a more natural right back. But Tommy Asu, obviously, he's he can, he's played at Bologna and right back very comfortably. He can also operate as a centre back in a back three on, on either side as well of that back three. I think he's also played left back. So another young player, I think he's 22 or 23, um, makes perfect sense to me. And I think for Spurs, it probably makes a lot of sense as well. Uh, so keep an eye on that one, see what happens. Um, I know there's some talk about other clubs coming in, potentially even Arsenal being interested, but it would seem that the initial contact, and certainly I think a bid has, had been made originally for Tommy Asu. Um So yeah, let's see kind of what happens now that now that they can kind of crack on with that, and then obviously his ankle thing is now a thing of the past. Um, obviously they need to get players out the door. You know, they've got Serge Aurier, you know, still expected to move, it's just to wear. Uh, Musa Sissoko, as I said in the last video, at the last I heard there hadn't been much interest in him, which is making it difficult to move him on. Davinson Sanchez, there is interest in, you know, certainly severe interest in him, which obviously will make people think of potentially Kunde. Um, I do wonder, while there, every every single fibre of my being would love the idea of a Romero Kunde partnership, is it putting two younger players together? Does that make is that awkward you know even like Joe Joe Roden you know I, I think Joe Roden is going to become a terrific centre-back but even Roden and Romero is that too young a partnership to put together um, which yeah I do find it all all intriguing the whole centre-back partnership thing I just and exactly what you can do with it and the dynamics it's it's I don't think it's cut as dry as you know, you or I would play football manager, we'd play FIFA, and age is no matter. You know, we, we we would put the best players in that team. But I guess in real life, doesn't always work like that. You really are more likely to have a more experienced centre-back partner. Not always, it does happen sometimes, but I think more likely you, you get that dynamic. Um, who else? Cameron Carter-Vickers, he's still to head out the door. Plenty of interest in him. I think it's just mainly finding the best deal for Tottenham, and, and obviously one that he wants as well. Young Dennis Serkin looks like he's going to move on permanently, which is a sad one. It looks like Sunderland may be going to get him. Um, a lot of people, I understand, will be going like, what? Why is he going? Um, but it sounds like, from what I'm told, that he, he didn't want to take up the offer of, of the, new, the new deal that was on the table from Tottenham or was being offered by Tottenham, um, looking to make it kind of elsewhere as a first-team player. I can understand that. You know, his pathway is, is somewhat blocked. You know, you've got Regulon, Sessignon, Davies, Tanganga can play there. I think he's been on the bench five or six times for the first team in, in almost every competition and has never been given minutes. So I can kind of understand it from that point of view. Um, yeah, just a shame to see a young, talented player go, you know, and how far he can go. Um I do like him as a left back. I see a lot of him in academy matches, and uh, yeah, I've been intrigued to see kind of where his level ends up being. Whether it ends up being maybe a Championship player, or whether he can go all the way and become a Premier League player. I hope for him, he's, he's a Premier League player. But I think now, the kind of focus on on what Tottenham get. I'd, I'd be stunned if there's not some kind of sell on clause in there where they get future money down the road. Because I I wouldn't imagine the fee would be a lot right now. But yeah, no, sad to see him go, obviously. And I mentioned Tanganga. It'll be interesting to see what happens with him. As I said before, he, um, Galatasaray, very serious interest in him, wanted to take him. Um, but as, I, as I'm aware, he, at the moment, uh, has had rejected that kind of their overtures. And I very clearly want to stress at the moment, because I think he's going to have a little look over the next few weeks, see what his options are, who comes into the club, how much minutes he's going to get, and then decide. Because I think, ultimately, Jaffet Tanganga is, is a Tottenham boy. He's come through the club. He would like to play for Tottenham Hotspur. And if there's an indication that he will get lots of minutes, potentially in the Cups and, and Europe, then, you know, maybe reassess his future in, in, or next step in January. However, 
if it looks like we, if Tommy Asu's coming in and they've got Doherty there as well, and he's unlikely to play at the right, and you know he told me he'd prefer to play in the centre back positions, but if they're going to bring in another two centre backs, and then they've already got, let's say, Roden Dyer or Sanchez does go, Tanganga's not going to get a lot of minutes, and I think then you have to seriously look at a loan. Spurs would prefer a UK loan for him, um, but you know ultimately be a down to him, and if the Galatasaray option is a good offer and he takes that, you know. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd, it'd be a shame to see him go, but I do think a little bit like Oliver, Oliver Skip, I do think he needs that um, that regular minutes every single uh, <coughs> excuse me every single week. Um, so that's that for now. I mean, like I said before, I, I could start talking about Vlajevic and strikers, and then looking further up the pitch at the likes of Damsgaard and um, oh, is it Mukwege? Noni Muk. I'm killing pronunciation, so I'm not even going to try that. The young 19-year-old um, who was at Tottenham as an academy player, Noni Madueki, I think it is. Um, so, yeah, that that will all come. Like I say, though, the priorities right now is another centre-back and a right-back. And I think once they've kind of got that secured, then they can definitely put their focus towards further up the pitch and also reacting to potential departures because there could be some departures that we're not you know, currently expecting. Like, say, there could be a bid, big bid comes in for... The likes of a let's let's say a Lucas Moura, for example. I'm not saying he's going to go, but using his example, he's a player Spurs have turned down big bids for in the past, and you never know a big bid can come in, and then it's a decision for Lucas and the club. And again, but that applies to any player. I'm not just saying that about Lucas. Um, let's talk about Harry Kane. Right, how do I term this? Um, I want to start off by saying I'm not going to say anything bad about Harry Kane. I, I'm just not because Harry Kane, I think, has been absolutely incredible for Tottenham. I've said this in, before. Honestly, he's probably given me more joy watching him progress and develop and come, become one of the world's best than any other player uh, at Tottenham Hotspur. You know, I, I love the skill of other players, the likes of Tongi, um, Eric Lamella over the past. But in terms of just a real joy to see someone become an utterly incredible world-class talent i think anyone can surpass harry kane um so i'm not if, if anyone's expecting me to come into this and go oh he's an absolute i've seen people call him a snake and things like this it's so it's too much that's not what i'm going to say at all um i'm going to talk about this a little bit about but obviously the statement that that's the thing that we're talking about that's the kind of the freshest thing the statement that came out yesterday, um, again, not long before I was going to the cinema, so I didn't really have much time to kind of react or do anything to, uh, it was very carefully worded. It very much was one of those statements where you look at what's not being said as much as what is being said. Um, and I think, um, I think it will have won, hopefully for Harry Kane, a lot of... Um, those people who are maybe undecided back uh, behind him, which is great for Harry Kane, because like I say, I you know, I don't think anyone should rubbish or write off what Harry Kane has done for Tottenham Hotspur because I think he's been incredible. What I would say, obviously in his statement, he said that as planned, he re re would return today to uh, Tottenham Hotspur Saturday. What I would say at, at this point... Um, when I'm filming this, it's a little fly that you may see just keeps going by my eye just to deliberately distract me. I don't know what he's going by. Every time he goes by. Um, but yeah, what I would say at this point of filming this, he hadn't yet returned today. But what I would also stress is because this is quickly where aggregator Twitter accounts go. Oh, the gold says Harry Kane has not returned to training. That doesn't mean anything he may be coming back this afternoon um because we must be aware uh, you must be aware that, that he's not coming back for training he will be coming back for um what do you call it uh covid test blood work stuff like that uh, so by all means that could be done this evening he could come uh, sorry this afternoon or even early evening it could be at any point so by the fact that at this point he hasn't come back in the day in the morning doesn't mean anything. Absolutely not saying he's not returning today. If he said he's returning today, he will return today because he knows he has to. Uh, what will then happen is I understand the current plan, current plan is for him to go into the lodge, uh, the big luxury hotel within the Hotspur Way training complex, and he will stay there uh, to isolate because of government restrictions. You know, if you're not fully vaccine jabbed up, 
then you have to isolate. It's what Gallini did and it's what um, Nuno Spirito Santo did as well. And the beauty of having uh, the lodge is that the player can then go and do his training on a private pitch by himself. I've had some people, I've put this out on Twitter earlier, and I've had some people saying, oh, isn't that convenient? Gets to isolate, gets to stay away. We don't get to see him, you know, keep him away so he can head off to Man City. It's it's what he would have had to do anyway. Um, and what I'd say is that you'd rather see him isolate at the training ground where he can continue training than isolate at home and you're definitely not going to see it. By all, by all means, they may be able to do photos, or he may be able to do photos of himself training away at Hotspur Way. You know, whereas I, I don't, I don't quite get that line of thinking. Um, how do I put this? Right. So, so the key thing is, is obviously a lot of people have been asking me. So, was it all made up then? Right. No. No. Um, again, like I said, I don't want to say anything bad about Harry Kane because I personally, I, I would, I would always question the device. Uh, as I said before, I'd question the advice that has been given to Harry Kane in recent, probably months, let alone weeks. Uh, <clears throat> what I would say, what we know, um, certainly within Tottenham Hotspur, they expected him to return Monday. Monday just gone. Uh, if you're watching this next Monday, I mean Monday, um, the week, so it was Monday, August the 2nd. That was when he was expected back at Tottenham Hotspur by those within Tottenham Hotspur. Whether that was what Harry Kane expected, I cannot comment on. Um, all I know that was on Monday morning, they expected to turn up for those COVID tests and the blood work. And he was still in the Bahamas um, and then later would go on to, to Florida on his holiday. That indicates to me that there was um, Harry Kane had a certain plan for how long he was going to spend off, and and then the club, you know, seemingly were or or did not agree to that. I, I don't know. I don't know. Either way, the only thing I'm aware of is that those within the club expected him back on Monday, and obviously this wasn't just me saying this. If you know, people will go, "Your information's wrong." I think you'll have seen every single media outlet was reporting that. So in those five days after that, at no point did Tottenham say that that's wrong. He's meant to come back on Saturday. At no point during those five days did anyone connected with Harry Kane say, no, that's wrong. He's meant to come back on Saturday. Um, Nuno Espirito Santo, we got to ask him questions on Wednesday night after the match at Chelsea. Um, at no point did no no spirit so Santo um, indicate that the player was to come back on Saturday um, he if anything just simply alluded to the fact that there was a problem and a problem that needed a solution and that he uh, hadn't spoken to Harry Kane at all at that point and that matters would be dealt with internally if Everyone at Tottenham was aware that Harry Kane was coming back on Saturday. I would have hoped that Nuno Espirito Santo would have come out at that press conference and said, no, no, it's fine, he's coming back on Saturday. That's all I would say on that situation. Um, and that's not definitely not to call Harry Kane a liar or anything, because like I say, if you look at the way the statement is worded, I think it's very carefully worded in a certain way. And I think there's a ways that you can take those sentences that you'd you'd be daft to say that he's lying or anything like that. Um I just would I'm just saying exactly what I understand the case to be from the Tottenham side. Um what I would also say, um and I wrote about this way back, personally, I do think it's a little bit unfair that and I think I may have said this in a previous video, I do think it's a bit unfair that the players who did better in the international tournaments, the Euros and the Copa America, in a way actually got penalised. Uh, because, you know, you look at, you know, and I, I did, again, I wrote this earlier in the, oh, when was it? It was either June or July. I wrote that I presumed that the likes of Harry Kane, Lo Celso, um, Hoybier and Sanchez would get 
the same month off that the likes of Roden, Davies, Laurie, Sissoko got. Uh, because uh, my understanding always with Tottenham is that the minimum they want the players to rest is three weeks, but preferably in most cases it's a month. Um, however, it looks to be the case that none of those players who got further ended up being given those uh, that month. Like you know, I think Roden, I think Roden, Lloris, and Davies. I think it's almost to the day a month after their last match at the Euros. Um, but clearly, and I can understand, it's more difficult for the players that got further to do that because, say, um, you know, let's let's say for instance, Harry Kane. Um, you know, Harry Kane was the final on the eleventh. So let's say that Harry Kane um, was able to return on the eleventh of August, a month later. Then. You know, and this is something other people have said as well. You know, the isolation then has to be factored in. Uh, and some people have said, you know, this is this is not my view, but some people I've seen on social media have said, well, if he was due to return on Saturday, or he's saying was planned to do on, uh, return on Saturday, why is returning on Saturday to then isolate? Would it not have been isolating to then return fully on Saturday, if you see what I mean? Um but yeah, so in the original thing I was saying, if you were to return on the 11th and then had to isolate, or even without the isolation, you are returning so close to that game. And it does make it difficult. And I understand, like I say, I understand players being kind of a bit like disgruntled at the fact of having to return uh, le within less time uh, than other players. But hey, you are kind of a victim of your own success and that they had incredible tournaments. And what I would say, which I don't think helped Kane's cause, was that... Lo Celso, obviously a Copa America winner. Uh, Pierre Mahoyber got to the, the semi-finals. They were both due to come back in on Monday, uh, the second, and ended up actually coming back two or three days earlier just to kind of crack on. And I obviously don't think that probably helps the look of the whole thing with Harry Kane. Um, see, so yeah, it's it's all a bit of a mess, and I think. I don't understand why the statement was waited until yesterday to come out, all of that time. I think if you wanted to make that statement, I think you made it earlier on. Um, you know, I, I th thought it was a bit of a, a bit of a funny one, but then you know, who am I to who am I to kind of comment on it? Um, I do think the timing yesterday was a bit rubbish, bearing in mind it came after that Pep Guardiola press conference, which was a weird one. Um, you know, especially as someone who's used to with um, Pochettino and Mourinho, and I think it's going to be the same with Espirito Santo, very much being told in press conferences, we will not talk about that player. He belongs to another club. That is disrespectful. And I kind of felt like Pep Guardiola's press conference was... It was a weird one. It was almost started off like he is a Tottenham player and then it just went far too in the other direction for me. It was all very much, well, Tottenham won't negotiate. Of course we want to sign him and all this. And it was a bit like, oh, I don't like that. I didn't like it at all. I thought it was all too public. Um, it almost was, I don't know. It, it, it didn't feel like the right way of going about it. I know I've said that <laughs> a fair bit in recent weeks, but it just didn't feel the right way of going about it at all. Um, I can't imagine it will have made Spurs very happy. I can't imagine it helped the scenario whatsoever. I just think the last few days, you know, Spurs were already clearly saying their intention was not to sell Harry Kane. I just got this feeling now that the last few days, they're only going to dig their heels in even further and just absolutely shut up shop. Because, you know, at this moment in time, we've had... Um, you know, there's been an indication that City would come back with it. There was talk of a, a potential earlier bid in the window and that they would come back with a bigger bid. Um, but the way Guardiola was talking is very much sounds like Spurs and Levy have just said, nope, not interested. Which, you know, would lend itself to Harry Kane getting, you know, upset, I guess. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens in the weeks ahead. I personally would still be very surprised if a deal were to happen, I just think so. There's so many obstacles in the way now. 
Um, and like I said, the Jack Grealish transfer it's coming in at 100 million makes it very clear that Tottenham would not accept anywhere near that amount or even start talking at anywhere near that amount. Uh, and then you're getting into just huge realms of figures. Um, and also you're at a stage where Tottenham then are getting less and less time to, to do deals to, to bring him in. And also clubs will be fully aware of the, the huge amount of money Tottenham would then have to spend. Um, and it's... Yeah, I'd be surprised. I mean, you can't rule anything out. Of course you can't in football. And you can't rule, you know... It'd be interesting to see kind of what the dynamic is with the other players and what the mood's like and, and how Harry Kane is. Like I've said, and I will repeat this, Harry Kane has always at Tottenham been held up to these standards of being an incredible professional. His teammates will always say that he is, you know, one of the best trainers out there. And I'd, I'd hope... And I'd be stunned if he doesn't return to Tottenham and, and continue those kind of standards. Um, but yeah, I just don't, I don't, you know, I'm trying to see an out for him. And unless Man City were to bid incredible money, I mean, there's talk of player swaps, but I can't even see, I think they're so difficult. And especially with no disrespect to Tottenham, I think I've said this before, but no disrespect to Tottenham. Why would a Man City player on their huge wages playing in the Champions League want to kind of come to Tottenham and no disrespect, play in the Europa Conference League. I mean, yes, Romero has just come from Atalanta in the Champions League to play in the Conference League. But for him, and this is again, I keep saying this, don't I, using this expression, no disrespect, no disrespect to Atalanta, it probably is still a step up in terms of the club. And especially Atalanta have had an incredible success in recent seasons. They've been fantastic under Gasparini. So that is to no way do down. But I think as a club and a history and probably a hell of a lot more wages as well, um, it's a good deal for Romero. Whereas I think a Man City player, it's, it is a coming down. Um, but yeah, we'll see what happens. We, we will. Um, it's a very weird situation. And like I say... This last week had just been odd. It's been really, really odd. And, and and hopefully by the time you're watching this, he's he's come back. Someone has reported, I'm sure Sky will have some chap getting absolutely drenched in the rain, standing outside Hotspur Way. And I'd imagine, um, you know, I'd be surprised if Harry Kane's people would want him kind of smuggled into the building in the cover of darkness or with tinted windows. You'd imagine they'd want it made clear that he was back after the reaction this week. So, uh, yeah, you know, I may well... This, by the time this comes up, you may have already seen that. That's the beauty of not only recording a video, but my 19, uh, 80s this week, 1980s dial-up internet, slowly uploading it to the World Wide Web. Um, but, yeah. So, Harry Kane, Christian Romero, transfers... Tomorrow, Arsenal um, in the Mind Series We've got both the men and women's team playing, so that'll be good fun. I'll be kind of watching those. It'll be interesting to see who takes part, uh, how close we get to the team that might start against Man City. I'm really intrigued to see what happens with Man City as well, because this is when I talk about Kane and, and not coming back, you know, there's a lot of players, I think, still from the Euros that haven't kind of fully integrated yet. And I think Man City. From the sounds of their Community Shield team, it's going to be very much a second string team. So I'd be intrigued to see how many are then back for the Tottenham game on the 15th. You know, you could be in a scenario where Tottenham actually have more fit first team players ready to play that match than Man City, which could be huge for Tottenham and Nuno Espirito Santo. Um, it could go completely the other way. And, and, you know, Man City may have everyone just perfectly timed and ready to be back for that. But. Yeah, I, th I think there's talk that De Bruyne and Foden maybe won't be back in time because of their injuries. Um, but yeah, it'd be interesting to see how that one goes. You know, He says, with hindsight, as people pick up this clip in two weeks' time after Spurs will wallop 5 nil at, uh, at the Tottenham Hotspur Stadium. But um, yeah, it may not be as huge a task as I think it was going to be. Um, that's not to say that Man City's second team still isn't incredibly strong, but there you go. Um, so yeah, now looking forward to the Arsenal game tomorrow. Um, Arsenal games, both of them. I don't know why that required air quotes. They are real games. Um, and then after that, probably most people will be delighted to know I have six days off ahead of the Man City game. I'm going to absolutely rest. It's it's my, actually my birthday on Monday. So who knows what could happen with Tottenham? You know, 
Tottenham always seemed desperate for me to work. You know, even last night, um, Kane and Romero stuff coming when I'd finished my shift and was heading into the cinema. So just imagine what a day off plus being my birthday. Um, who knows what could happen? It could be the most messy. It's not going to be messy, but <laughs> it looks like PSG. Oh, Pochettino has gone from working with, um, you know, probably getting very frustrated with some of the signings at Tottenham. He could end up next season having... Messi, Neymar and Mbappe as his front three. Whoa! That is incredible. Um, I'm kind of happy for him in that aspect. It's, it's silly football. It's, you know, it is very much FIFA football, isn't it? Um, and, and, you know, I think especially with the Poch pre-season in them as well, I think PSG will absolutely smash it. And, you know, some people will rightly say, does it does it count for as much if you've exp- expensively assembled that kind of thing? I mean, you look at um, Pep at City... I think someone said that if he now makes another transfer uh, or a big transfer, he's going to surpass the one billion pounds spent on players in his reign at Man City. That's just that's incredible. You know, it's not football as we know it, but you know, it's it's just unfortunate the way sport and business works. It really does. But uh, yeah, sorry. Back to the perfect storm of my day off and birthday combining on the same day. Uh, hopefully, that means you'll get something big happen on Monday. Um, I'm sure I won't be able to stay away um, during the week ahead, and I probably will. I might do a video. We'll see how we go. Uh, depends what happens, um, but I do need to have a little bit of a rest. As you can see, I look rather knackered, um, and I'm sure my family would like me to have a bit of a rest as well. Um, so, hey, I've actually waffled on for far longer than I thought I was actually going to do in this video. So you got 40 minutes. I was going to say a good 40 minutes. I wouldn't say it was a good 40 minutes, but you got more than 40 minutes. Um, and I'm going to head off and... Enjoy what is a day off today, which may mean something happens this afternoon. Um, but there you go. So, yeah, um, I th- I'm just trying to think if I've ticked every box I wanted to talk about. I think I have. I'm sure there'll be people saying, what about this? What about that? But I will cover that at a later date, hopefully. Just remind me. So, yeah, I'm going to head off now. As always, look after yourselves. Stay healthy. Stay safe. And uh, I shall catch you later. Goodbye.